Hello, and welcome to the Technical Marketers Meetup. My name is Veda Kamarjigada. Thank you all for joining us today. Just a little housekeeping before we get started. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the question box in your GoToWebinar control panel, and we will try to address those during the presentation at, and at the end. We will also send the recording of the webinar and a link to all the documents we highlighted, so please be on the lookout for this email. Thank you all for joining once again, and we can get started. And I'm sure you're all from familiar with our forward-looking statement, please make any purchasing decisions on products and services that are currently available. And once again, my name is Veda Kamarji Gooda. I'm a product marketing manager here at the Marketing Cloud. I focus on mobile as well as Einstein. I've been at Salesforce for about two years. And previous to that, I was at Rebel where I supported building out interactive email experiences. And with me, I have two wonderful subject matter experts, Tyler Staley and Bill Moat. Would you both like to hop in and say hello and give an introduction? Sure thing. Hey, this is Tyler Staley. Uh, thanks for that, Veda. Um, I'm the product manager for Mobile Push. Um, that's fully inclusive of the mobile SDK, um, inbox, in-app messaging, and then geolocation, which is the talk point for today. Bill? Thank you, Tyler. Uh, Bill Moat. I'm the senior Android engineer on the Android Mobile Push SDK product. I've been on the team for six years. There's no hiding behind any of it. If there's code in there, I've either written it or I have signed off on it. Thanks for your time, both of you, and I'm excited to dive in. But before I hand it over to Tyler to actually define what geolocation is, I wanted to give an overview of mobile as a channel. So when we talk about mobile, we're often grouping SMS, chat apps, mobile app engagements, such as push notifications, in-app messaging, app inbox messages, even mobile optimized websites together. So from our state of the connected customer report, we saw that 57% of customers have stopped buying from a company because a competitor has provided a better experience. So taking advantage of mobile to provide cohesive customer experiences is incredibly important. And mobile is a great differentiator because it allows for real-time engagement. You can reach your customers on the device and channel they're using to create meaningful, relevant content. It's also location-based, which we're going to be talking about to today. You can engage with your customers with the right context based on where they are in the world. And you can unlock all the different mobile channels that I just mentioned to deliver the right experience at the right time. And from that same report, the State of the Connected Customer, we saw that most customers were spending around four hours on their device. And this was pre-COVID, so I'm sure the screen time has gone up. People are on their phones. And we've also seen from this past year that our mobile devices help us bridge the physical and the digital. So for example, maybe ordering Starbucks on your app and then running into the store to pick it up. So at the end of the day, the end user's behavior is continuing to evolve. And as marketers, we need to innovate on how they engage with the user at that individual level. So today we're going to be focusing on push notifications as well as some other um, mobile app engagement tools such as inbox or in-app messages. Push notifications are important as a reminder of your app even if you don't actually get a direct click through from that push notifications. Push notifications actually increase app usage as much as 88% and they provide a personalized real-time customer experience. You can help customers develop habits to drive retention and it turns your mobile device into a rich data source. And I'll talk a little bit more about this um, once we get into the roadmap, but we're developing a few artificial intelligence tools and automation tools to drive push notifications such as send time optimization. So we're bringing those Einstein features that you're familiar with in your email to your mobile devices. 
So I'm going to give you an example of how geolocation, beacons, and geofencing work together with push notifications to create a personalized experience. So Rachel, she is an avid runner. She's been running all through uh, the summer and quarantine, and she needs a new pair of running shoes. So she walks into Northern Trail Outfitters, and she's a loyal customer. She's an app user. She's actually logged into the NTO app right now. She uses it to track her runs as, as well as to participate in the community. She starts browsing through the store. She... Um, hasn't talked to any associates, and she's at the footwear section of the store. There's a beacon there, so um, NTO knows that she's standing in front of the sh of the store. She's trying on shoes, but she hasn't made any purchases. It's been almost 30 minutes. So she gets a push notification. The push notification actually deep links her into the app where she can take a personalization quiz to find out what is the right shoe for her needs. So you can see that is an example of using push notifications and geolocations to drive a conversion. However, there's a ton of different use cases that you can bring to life, targeting the customer at the right place and the right time. So at the top of the funnel, Imagine um, using push notifications to let a customer receive a message that there's a discount at the store closest to them. And that NTO example, that's a drive to convert. But you can also use it to offer last minute coupons to draw the customer back into the store after leaving. You can also um, build loyalty by having um, users scan their receipts. And you can create that um, physical and digital customer experience to help guide your customers throughout different events. So, you know, when we're back in a stadium, maybe um, a push notification reminding the customer that they can uh, reserve a hot dog and a beer that they can pick up during the seventh inning. Or maybe you can get a drink during the intermission without having to uh, wait in line. Also, a welcome message as as a customer enters your event with tips on how to make the best of their experience and how to use the app, or even a thank you message as someone leaves a location with a deep link to a satisfaction survey. There are tons of different experiences that you can create, um, and these are just a few use cases, but you know your customers the best, so take the next 30 minutes as Tyler talks about this even more and as Bill shows as a demo to really envision of how you would bring this to your customers. So with that, I will pass it over to you, Tyler. Awesome, thank you very much, Veda. So I think the big question is, what is geolocation? As consumers, we probably have a big idea of what geolocation is. We've used all these consumer grade apps um, for ride hailing or for directions like Google Maps. But in the context of Marketing Cloud, geo geolocation is something very specific. It's tooling that allows you to engage your customers at the right time, at the right place. And with that contextual awareness, you should also be able to deliver the right message. So it's very, very powerful because it's an extremely effective means of engaging your audience. And that's seen in the data, a two to five times increase in your CTR versus traditional uh, broadcast messaging, and it, and it makes total sense. You have so much contextual awareness of where the customer is, what their state of mind is, you should be able to deliver a very effective message. Within Marketing Cloud, we have two different ways to engage your user base based on location. The first is on um, effectively the OS GPS signals, and the second one is around proximity to um, Bluetooth enabled beacons. And I'll cover those here in this next slide. On the on the left hand side, this is the geofences, and that's a it's somewhat of a distinctly different use case than what you would see here on the right hand side, which are your Bluetooth enabled beacons. When we go over to the left with Marketing Cloud, we have different capabilities to trigger a push notification based on whether someone is entering a particular geofence or whether they are exiting a particular geofence. And you can start to think through the use cases where you might apply this for your application and your customer base. When you think of the geofences, this is generally a larger radius. It's a best practice to at least have geofences that are 150 meters in radius. These are gonna be circling kind of larger buildings, 
um, or full-blown airports or states or zip codes, cities. Um, these may be things like a, a large fence around um, a shopping mall just off the highway. This isn't always the exact case, but the general rule of thumb is these are gonna be situations where someone is being transported in one way or another. Maybe they're driving a car around, maybe they're flying that plane. It, there are times, of course, where they may be walking. You think about a large mall and maybe a certain segment of the strip mall has the geofence. So it may trigger in that way. But generally, these are kind of larger areas where people are moving with some sort of vehicle. When you look at the right-hand side, beacons are much more specific. They are much more pointed. Uh, and they're much more exact. We can actually get into nearly an inch of where a person is standing. And, and these are great for when a person is actually walking through a particular area. You can think of this as they're in the aisle of a store um, or they are walking at a trade show or a festival by a particular location and you want to signal them with a push notification. So these are much more exact, um, whereas the fences are a bit more broad in that way. So what isn't geolocation? I think this is absolutely critical in today's day and age for marketers. Um, as consumers, there's definitely been, privacy is top of mind probably more than ever. I think marketers definitely know this. And when you talk about geolocation, this is absolutely critical that we're thinking about privacy. And with Marketing Cloud as an engagement platform, privacy and efficiency are absolutely number one top of mind. Um, our SDK is completely built with these two things in mind. The, the first, and I think maybe the most important is, is around customer trust and consumer trust, is we do not activate any aspect of geolocation without direct and explicit user consent. Marketing Cloud isn't pulling any tricks. There are no workarounds. You can trust our product. The consumers can trust you. Only if they give explicit consent will we actually activate the functionality. The second one here is around actual movement tracking. When you think about geolocation as a consumer, you're generally thinking about um, you know, something like the ride hailing application. It can walk, it can follow me. It's that little dot on the screen. It's following me every turn that I take. Or when you're thinking about something like a Google Maps, it's turn by turn instructions. That is not how the mobile push SDK operates. In fact, actually the SDK is patented to blend both accuracy and location and also battery efficiency. And we'll kind of explain how that works in a moment. And the last point here is that we are very efficient. We usually, when you think about the activating and using location with your applications, consumers are used to the battery drain. Um, and a lot of that is related to the apps that kind of use that very precise location for step-by-step -step tracking of users. We do not, again, operate that way. We have the patent where we're blended with accuracy and efficiency. And in fact, I think on the Android side, we use less than 1% of battery with all functionality enabled. And on the iOS side, it's about 1% of battery with all functionality enabled in our SDK. So we are very efficient when it comes to battery usage as well. So how does this work in the context of Marketing Cloud? And I'm going to kind of explain more of the, the marketer point of view here, the actual creation of the fences and the campaign itself. And then the next screen will go through a slightly more technical explanation so you understand what's happening in the background. Um, and the process here is effectively the exact same between geofences and beacons. There's just a couple details that are slightly different. So I'll cover it here at the top, but it applies in both. So the first step that you'll do is you'll go into Mobile Push, the application in Marketing Cloud, and we have a tab for location. You can kind of see an example here on the right-hand side. You will create a net new location. You'll define the size of your geofence. And again, a best practice is a radius of at least 150 meters. And that best practice, by the way, is given to us from both Apple and Google. After you have created this geofence, you'll then continue through the workflow and associate a push notification to the fence. And we give you a couple other controls around this um, in terms of kind of throttling or displaying of the notification. And then lastly, you'll go and kind of quote unquote send the geofence to the device. And 
when that happens, it's an important distinction. We'll kind of cover what this means later. This means that everyone in your audience is eligible for this geofence. So if you created this around Manhattan, even a user that was in California, if they flew over and they landed and they walked around in Manhattan, it could trigger the push notification. Um, a quick note is I kind of just talked about the way to do this through the UI, but if you wanted to create geofences in bulk, we do have a REST API, so you can do that kind of programmatically if you need to spawn things potentially on demand as well. And again, this pattern applies to, to geofences as well, just slightly different details. So how does it actually work? Again, they're fairly similar. There's a there's a nuance I'll point out with the with the beacons. But on the geofence side, what is happening is that after you have gone and kind of quote unquote sent that geofence, effectively what happens is that the SDK is syncing up with Marketing Cloud. It's saying thank you for that information and those coordinates, and it registers those with the underlying operating system. So this is iOS and this is Android. And what we're doing is we're really asking the operating system to just tell us when those coordinates are breached in one way or another. So the SDK is actually very passive in this regard. We sit back and we completely just wait for the OS to tell us when that has been breached. Um, and both the OS and ourselves, we have logic to make sure it's a very efficient process. Then once the line has been crossed, the OS will go and tell the SDK, hey, this has happened they have crossed the fence that you registered with me. And the SDK will take that, maybe do a little bit of evaluation logic, and then they will trigger the associated push notification. And an important call out here in terms of your overall kind of customer experience, this trigger can work both when the app is in the foreground and the background. So it doesn't matter whether or not they don't have their phone actually on them, we'll send it. Or if they're looking at their phone right then and there, we'll kind of get it and we'll display the notification top of mind. When we go over to beacons, it's a very similar pattern. The concept's the same. One of the important distinctions though is that when we're talking about Bluetooth beacons, we're talking about physical devices that are kind of planted in specific areas. Now on this example on the right-hand side, you can see where they have planted these geo beacons or these, these uh, Bluetooth beacons in different areas of the store. And these beacons have different IDs and identifiers, et cetera, that are registered in Marketing Cloud. So you will actually register those in Marketing Cloud. And then that whole sync process and registration with the OS process, that is the exact same as, as I had described above. So the, really the nuance there is you're dealing with a bit of hardware. You have to make Marketing Cloud aware of it. Then Marketing Cloud and the SDK and the OS, we take care of the rest from there. And again, this also, um, once we trigger the push notification, we can display it both in the foreground and in the background. So some best practices around geolocation. I, I kind of split this into two. I think these are the, the, the big takeaways. The first is around strategy. And I've alluded to it a few times, especially when we were talking about uh, privacy. The, the world is getting a lot stricter around user privacy and leveraging user data, particularly around advertisements and marketing. And Geolocation, I think, is one of those very unique areas where it, it could become very sensitive if it's not done correctly. Um, you definitely need to be able to build trust with your user base and make sure that you are not abusing it. And that really starts by deeply understanding what it is that your user base wants from you and what kind of customer experience they ultimately want from you. And then where is the line? What is too far? You definitely need to internalize that. So it starts with understanding your customer and kind of where the line is. I think the second one there is you need to ask for permission and be explicit in identifying first what the value prop is of the customer giving you this information, the location information. But the second is how you actually plan to use the data. Again, this is about building trust with the end consumer. Then start eating, actually in that process, Consider making commitments on how you are not going to use geolocation information. That will go, I think, a long way in terms of building the consumer trust and then ultimately allowing the app to be able to use uh, location data. The last area or the last sub bullet there, consider potential backlash of being too targeted is kind of what I was referring to. It, 
this is a very powerful technology. It's the right time. It's the right place. You can have the right message. You can maybe have too good of a message sometimes where some customers may think that it's a little bit creepy, the information that they're getting. And I think Bill and I will probably reference uh, an example later on about shopping in a store. But you can imagine where you're almost getting too precise about someone leaving somewhere or entering somewhere where they, th they may feel like they're being watched by Big Brother or something like that. So definitely be careful about how you want to use your messaging. Within strategy, and this is somewhat execution related, consider leveraging the other mobile push channels that you get out of the box. It really is kind of the power of the mobile push ecosystem. Think about in-app messages, for example. When you really want to drive the end consumer to allow the opt-in for location, there is no better tool than in-app messaging. You can display and trigger the in-app message to display to the user. It's very much um, apparent to the user. You have enough space to, to explain the value prop, and then the call to action is right there in the application. So consider in-app messaging when you're trying to get permission or consent for location opt-ins. From an execution standpoint, B Bill and I were kind of laughing about this earlier, uh, today and yesterday, every time, I don't know why I think it's funny, but consider the sizing of these fences and what the actual use case is gonna be and the user journey as they're going to actually cross the geofence. The, the, a good example of doing this perhaps the wrong way is if you have a store that's off the highway, it's just off of a certain exit. But what you want to do is draw a very large geofence so that the end user can get the notification well in advance of that exit so that they can actually get the notification, they can read the notification, they can make a decision, and they can take that exit to your location. The last thing you would want to do is paint this geofence at the exit itself because by the time the user can do all of those things, they've already flown right by the exit. So definitely think about the sizing of the fences in that regard. The second is, again, in, in best, practice, best practices, you're going to want to plant these geofences usually in static places. Um, this isn't necessarily working like a ride hailing application where we're tracking an individual device and we're tracking how close the uh, the cab is from us and we're doing some math to connect the dots and give an ETA. That's not really what Marketing Cloud's geolocation is about. This is really designed for engagement. So these are generally static locations. It's predictable. People are coming by them. Um, they're not these on-demand, you know, on-demand spawned and then calculated in between. Again, we're not doing the precise turn-by-turn, step-by-step tracking because um, that's not really the use cases for Marketing Cloud. I think we went a little bit backwards on that slide. Oop, think the other direction, sorry, Veda. All right, so what does SDK implementation look like? Uh, before I go in the implement implementation steps, which are fairly light, by the way, on the right-hand side are actual examples where you can go and see examples yourself. So Mobile Push has a learning app um, up on GitHub. We have code examples, whatever you need on the right-hand side for both Android and iOS. Feel free to check those out. When we come back to the right-hand side on the quick start, I'm making the assumption that you've already effectively implemented the SDK. You kind of put in your config information. Maybe you already have push notifications set up, and now you want to add this geolocation functionality. It's actually very, very simple. You're just going to config configure the SDK with location turned on, location equals true. And then the SDK pretty much takes it from there. Um, you don't really need to worry about anything else. But a call out that I will have is that you should only turn this on if you're legitimately planning to use the feature. Because if you're just turning this on for, hey, we might just use this in a year or two, that's a, that's a waste of battery resources, although minimal, it's a waste of battery resources. It's also a waste of resources on the marketing cloud side. So geolocation does take up server space on the marketing cloud side. It is generally, we can handle things, but if we see abusive behavior, you're probably gonna see a note coming from myself personally and say, hey, what are you guys doing? You have geolocation turned on. You haven't sent a message in who knows how long, like why is this even on to begin with? 
So that's the best practice there is only really turn it on if you are going to ship to production and you have the explicit intent to actually use the capabilities. Um, the other thing I wanted to note on that is currently there's no remote way to turn off location. So this is configured in the SDK, it's on or off. Um, if you want to make a change, you would do that effectively um, alongside of an update to the App Store. Some other things to consider here, some additional customizations. The first one is probably the more important, so I'll cover that. It's around segmentation and filtering on the device itself. So earlier I mentioned that when you go and you send these geofences out, it will apply to all of your customer base, all the devices. So one way that you can kind of narrow this down or filter this down is that you can use the data that's already stored on the SDK. So the SDK captures user attributes, it captures um, tag events. You can use those with a little bit of manipulation to filter out the display of particular notifications. An example on this being, I drew the fence and all over Manhattan, but I'm someone who lives in Indianapolis and perhaps we don't want people from Indianapolis to get scared by the big city, I don't know. So maybe there's some logic in there where we can suppress those messages to the people who are from Indy so that they're not triggered when they're over there in Manhattan. And I think if we go to the next slide, I believe we have a demo. So Bill, I will pass this over to you. Right on, thank you. And uh, if you could hit play on that and I'll just talk about what you're gonna see. We talked about Rachel and her running and She's going to run a route. She's going to head out of her house. And for whatever reason, she has a geofence defined around her house, and it's going to be an exit fence. And you'll see that it popped up in the notification at the top. I'm, we're going to run around. I'm going to have a, a point of interest fence that's defined around Merriam Square in Charleston, South Carolina. That's going to pop up, and we're going to see that. I'm going to pull down the pane in a moment, and you'll be able to, to see them. And we have a fence, a larger fence, then around the entire neighborhood that uh, Rachel lives in and so that there's a, a welcome for this neighborhood and then a welcome fence for when she comes back to her house and that just kind of trying to show how those fences are going to work and what the notifications are going to look like we'll drag down and we'll see that the Marion Square is actually a, a notification with a bunch of text in it from the wiki and if you click that the fence can actually take you out to other content. So in this case that we used an open direct link and we linked out to a website, we can have regular just text messages. We can have uh, media rich pushes that are in here. You can deep link into your application so that if there was something specific, we mentioned that we were standing maybe in the TV aisle and they were near a TV a specific uh, Samsung brand, maybe for instance, and then you could deep link into that content when you gave them these push notifications. So one of the things that uh, Tyler talked about in use cases that was always interesting to me in the, if let's say you're a, a, a pizza place and you wanna send out a, a text message to try to get people to buy pizza and you send that out and you're using Einstein analytics to get it targeted to the right people at the right time and so that they buy pizza, right? You don't want to send that message maybe at two o'clock in the afternoon. That won't do much good. But imagine if you could collect the information that, you know, Bill logs into your app and he's 45 and you know that he's a, a single dad and you use a geofence and you know when he left work, then maybe you want to target that, you know, hey, why don't you stop by and pick up a pizza on the way home? And that you know, right message at the right time and hitting them in the spot where they're more likely to purchase something, you know, you, you close more deals, right? You turn you turn more of those opportunities into actual purchases. So uh, be creative and you can be creative without being creepy. And it just is, it'll be up to you on how you implement those features, those fences and those messages for your customers. Yeah, and Bill, would you mind also kind of rearticulating? We talked about this earlier about an example, I guess, of the creepy, how much is too far, I think, in, in the aisle. Would you mind kind of giving an example of that? Sure. So uh, big box store, you, you had it up on the screen and there was a, a gentleman that was standing near home goods. Say so there's the, you're standing there with the beacon. Uh, use the SDK, set an attribute or a tag for that consumer. You know that it's Bill. You know who I am. I'm a loyalty customer. I was standing near your home goods section. And then you also know that there's a fence that you've defined around your building 
and that Bill has left the building. You know, I've gone out into the parking lot, I've exited the facility. Maybe in neither of those events, you know, did you show a message at the point that that happened? You know, so maybe you took down the fact that Bill was in Home Goods. Maybe you took down that he was in your store, you know, today, and you set attributes for those. And then you've built a data extension that looks at that data and says, all right, Bill is in our store. He's a loyalty customer. He stood in the home goods section for a while and he didn't make a purchase. Let's shoot him a solicitation, you know, via text message or uh, via a uh, push message and say, hey, come back for a 5% off in our uh, home goods section and try to use that, right? That creates a scenario where you're giving the customer something for the fact that they've given you the access to that location information. And that is a spot where it may or may not be creepy. Again, like you, you'll have to choose on how much how much you want to collect that and how you want to use it but that would be a point that if someone offered that to me i would i would enjoy that if you knew that i was standing looking at a tv and i followed up and got a coupon for a tv because i didn't buy one that would be amazing yep and he, yeah so each brand again knowing knowing your user base and knowing when it's okay to get that personalized um, i think it's important when we're talking about geolocation all right i think yep so in terms of roadmap there is an explicit item that i wanted to cover with you guys relating to geolocation uh, and then i'll pass it over to veda for some recent items we've had with einstein one of these items that we are exploring for next year right safe harbor and all is the thought of geolocations as entry sources into jb so today with geolocation it's very much tied into mobile push um, and the concept of push notifications. And you could export this data, throw it into a data extension, that, and then make this a, um, an entry source for a journey today. But we're thinking about making this more out of the box, where the location event just happens, throw them into the journey, and then you could retarget with whether it's follow-up push notifications or emails or whatever it is. You can have a full-blown customer journey around that. So this is something we are giving some thought to right now. I definitely wanted to bring this out because it helps in terms of on-demand segmentation. Um, and it's just something, it, it's an ease of use where you can do everything kind of in one place. I've heard plenty of customer feedback around this. So definitely want you to know we're thinking about it, we're discussing it. Um, and hopefully if everything lines up, maybe this is something we deliver next year. So with Beta, gonna, I'll pass yeah. it over to you. That's gonna be a great feature. Sorry, I'm having some issues with my slides today, but that's gonna be a great feature and I'm very excited for that. But um, Similarly, I mentioned this earlier on in the presentation, we are working on ways to bring uh, strategic strategies for mobile campaigns. So Einstein features that allow marketers to automate or get insights or deep integrations within that mobile channel. So we're just really strengthening our mobile platform. Um, so things that have come out, we have send time optimization, which came out in August. And this is everything that you've seen for email, but for mobile push, get the right message on top uh, when the person is more likely to open it. Einstein engagement scoring, so bringing that, uh, those abilities to Journey Builder for mobile, as well as a deeper Google Analytics app and web integration. And that's coming out in 22. Um, and with that, I think we can move forward to questions. This is just a reminder that you can use the questions tab in your GoToWebinar to ask. Um, one second, I'm going to pull up some of the ones that we have already. So just give me a second. Okay, so uh, we have a question here that is around integration with Interaction Studio. Yeah, unfortunately, I'm not yet super familiar uh, with Interaction Studio. I do believe that they are doing some um, aspects of geolocation as well for that kind of real-time interaction management. Um, We'll probably have to get back to you on that one though. Um, I think Beta and I can maybe circle back on that. Okay, that, yeah, that sounds good. Um, someone asks if how to send geolocation push messages, but to only segmented audience. So, you know, clients who still haven't purchased or 
uh, different segments here? Yeah, that's a good question. And, and really the answer to that is why that roadmap item is uh, was on the screen that I showed. The, the, the entry source, the journey builder concept is really how I would see that going in the future. You know, today, like I mentioned, it's we're going to draw that fence kind of to everyone. And you could do some on-device segmentation. But if today you wanted to do more targeted segmentation, what you could do is use something like um, the mobile push detailed extract, where we have some raw data of whether or not people crossed a geofence. You could take that, you could segment that against other data sets, and then you could retarget those individuals. So that's one way you could do it today. The idea for having things a little more out of the box would just to be have a journey builder activity um, where you'd have a little bit more control as it's the entry source, then maybe have some filter criteria right afterwards and the journey continues from there. And we've referenced the on device a couple of times and that was it's been brought up in the questions for this uh, also and that in the SDKs we offer a, a should show notification convenience method that allows your business logic and your application to inject itself into that process such that we give you the notification message and all the details around it and you can look at that message and make a decision about the user that is currently using the device and where they're at and what you know about them to determine if you wanted to display the message one of the things that tyler said was you had someone flying from indiana to new york the message was specifically targeted to New Yorkers, for instance, and you would use that should show notification and you would say, okay, so user dot, you know, uh, home state maybe is something that you have set in through your application and through your SDK, you know that Bill is Indiana, and there would be no reason to show the New York message then and you could simply return false on whether or not that logic should show that message for that person. Another question we received was around uh, location permissions on iOS 14. Uh, yeah, Bill, do you want to take that one? Sure. It, iOS 14 introduced more privacy con controls for consumers. And one of those things is to turn off precise location. You can now give an, uh, an approximate location back to any of the applications on your phone that want to use location. When you do that, that will disable geofence messaging as a, <clears throat> a point that we would never be able to get an accurate enough location from the device in order to give any kind of meaningful you know, messaging for it unless you were really looking at uh, identifying something at the state level because the approximate locations are going to be city-based in you know, you'll get a random point somewhere in Indianapolis. You wouldn't want to tell someone, you know, welcome to our store. Thanks for coming in when they're six, seven miles across town. Another question that came in is around uh, the engagement metrics that are available for mobile push. Yeah, so the engagement metrics are, I, I forget the exact wording of them, I apologize for them, but I believe we have, I think they're traditional, they act as traditional open events. Um, and then we would populate that a fence was crossed. I forget the terminology, I apologize. Maybe we'll get back to you with the terms, but effectively we present the data that a fence was breached um, and that the notification as always is kind of traditional engagement data, whether it's opened or not. Thanks. Another one that we got in, is it possible to personalize the default ID on Marketing Cloud for the customer that is not registered? So any customer without a sub key. To personalize the ID, I'm not entirely sure what that is referencing, but I guess I'll say it in this way. So with the SDK, if you're not able to so first off, we create a random anonymous GUID to represent every single device ID. And then you can actually set the contact key for a user if you discover who the user is. Maybe there's a login event or something like that. You can set the contact key so that it's unified with the rest of Marketing Cloud. Um, if you don't know the contact key, the SDK, effectively what happens is that we create a random GUID as the contact key. So we pretty much are saying, hey, this is an anonymous user because 
you, the customer, hasn't set the contact key. We know that this person's anonymous. If a month later comes by that they're on the device and they finally log in and you get that information, you can then set that contact key and identify, oh, this was Bill. This is Bill Moat. And then we will submit that up in the marketing cloud. So we do have mechanisms for if you don't know who someone is, we kind of create an, anon an anonymous version of them on your behalf. Mm -hmm. And then once you discover them, um, we'll go and we'll update that in Marketing Cloud. And we have a mobile publisher question in here. So the question is, can an application developed 100% in Community Cloud, Sales Cloud, and mobile publisher be compatible with this capability? Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, this is something I'm, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Uh, and again, uh, safe harbor <laughs> on this one. We have been working with the mobile publisher team um, on implementing, on, on being able for a, a customer is in mobile publisher, they're creating an app, you know, using um, these, this UI tooling. And one of the aspects of that is that you'd be able to bring in the mobile push SDK and actually configure aspects of the mobile push SDK. Um, uh, geolocation hasn't been the number one feature that we're working on with them for that seamless integration. There, there are others tied to the core messaging channels, um, but I think this is definitely something that we can consider for the roadmap and, and definitely voice it to, I'll, I'll take it and I'll, I'll make sure that the mobile publisher PM is aware of it as well, because um, we're really excited about this kind of out of the box seamless integration with mobile publisher and we're already laying the foundation for it. So. As we mentioned earlier, implementation of Geofence after you have that foundation is very lightweight and easy. Um, so we can discuss it with him. Cool. Um, we have a question in here about the first steps integrating Marketing Cloud with an app. Yeah, another good question. Um, I, I hear this often and the way I guess I would phrase this is when you're thinking about mobile push, I'm, I'm gonna assume that your organization already has the mind share in saying, we're gonna have mobile app messaging. Um, you know, we're, we're, we've maybe already, they're, they're committed to it in one way or another. When we're talking about the actual implementation, you need to be thinking about the SDK. This SDK is used on over a billion different devices. We have a full dedicated staff around, a staff of engineers working on this SDK. We have plenty of best practices built into this SDK. So your first step is really, you know, work with your marketing team, define what you're trying to accomplish and what priority is. You know, maybe you're starting with push notifications and then you want to get into in-app messaging or maybe geolocation messaging. And make sure that your development team is aware of that because then they need to go and they need to look at the, the technical documentation of the SDK and implement that. So that really is, is the first step. I like to say the, the, a lot of people, you know, we've heard feedback over time, you know, or asked, how long does it take? How long will it take us to, from a technical standpoint, <clears throat> implement the SDK? From the, the engineering side, it is incredibly quick and it will have a complete, uh, another webinar that will cover those things. But getting it, the dependencies into the application, getting it uh, set up and configured and able to send your first push is hours of work you know not days not months it's it's literally hours of work and if you have done it before it's minutes of work in order to do it the real time that you're going to spend is where tyler said and that's going to be working between the marketing team and the engineering team and identifying what kinds of data you're going to collect about that consumer how that's going to get sent to the marketing cloud and then how you're going to use that to personalize and segment the audiences that you send to that's where the yeah. real time will be spent yeah, yeah, that, that's a good point, Bill. And and another thing I'll I'll say for for the marketers in there, you know, you get excited uh, when you hear a low amount of work from the engineers. So, some of it is also just the processes that we've we've noticed. You know, larger enterprise customers, the processes around QA testing and staging environments, things like that. You know, that will take time as well. Every organization is totally different in those. Um, definitely consider those um, into the length of time to implement. And I, I'm guilty as this as a PM. It's also scope creep. Um, <laughs> you definitely think you know what you want. And then once you start to, once the engineers start working on things, you realize, oh, wait, I really wanted this too. Or actually, I wanted to do this the other way. It, it creates a little bit of churn. So if you can define those things up front, be crisp and clear, um, do a lot of homework up front. Because then when you hand things over to your engineering team, they know precisely what to do.
Tyler's famous for, oh, that was really cool. Can you do this too? <laughs> right, right. Everyone is, though. It, not just me, hopefully. There's another uh, fun one in here. How minimal of an area can geolocation be applied to? Is it a city block? Is it a corner of an intersection? Um, and there's a, a follow-up or question around accuracy. Bill, you want to take these? Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. And Tyler and I had this discussion yesterday as we we're you know, putting all the decks and everything together and, and walking through this. The theoretical minimum is a positive integer, right? So you could have one as the minimum that you could tell Google or Apple to monitor a fence for. Our own UI will accept a value as low as 65 meters, but the best practices listed by Google and listed by Apple are 150 meters. And that, you know, on your best non-military grade GPS, you're gonna get to six feet of accuracy when you, someone is out and they've actually got all the satellites pinging against your phone and where you're going to be. So six feet of accuracy, you know, is where you're going to get to. But you have to think about the practical application of what your fence and what you're trying to decide that you want it to do. And even, you know, 65 meters is not really that large of a space. And when you put it on a, a map and you start drawing these fences, you'll see that 150 meters gives the device time because we are using passive monitoring of it, right? We're waiting for the operating system to recognize that fences have been, uh, boundaries have been crossed and then processing that into an entry or an exit, depending on which kind of message that you set up to display. And so those are, when you get 150 meters in there, it's giving you time to cross that fence and the phone to recognize that it has crossed that boundary that it's set to monitor and alerting the SDK. And then as you know, Tyler noted, one of the use cases that we see is uh, we an early customer of this was setting up fences and the minimum was 65 and they were setting up 65 meter fences and they were putting it over top of their location that happened to be right off the corner of a, a highway exit. And at 70 miles an hour, most of those fences didn't even recognize that they had been blown through and, uh, and were never even notified. And we talked them into spreading that fence out large enough to give the person enough time to recognize that they've gotten into it, gotten the message, been able to see the message and then make a decision on uh, whether or not they wanted to get off the highway and do that. So those fences are very use case specific and you need to think about how you're gonna use them. If you made a, and conversely, if you're trying to get the, you know, uh, welcome to my big box hardware store, and you put one of those giant fences that you used on the highway out there, you know, you've got some 300, 400 meter fence that you've put around it and they're gonna get a welcome message and they're across the street at McDonald's. That makes no sense, right? So in that case, you're gonna wanna use a very small, very targeted fence uh, somewhere near the front door or in the parking lot of the facility that you're uh, trying to get the fence message for. So it really is use case specific. Long, long story, uh, long story longer, you know, it, you can use as small as 65 meters. We wouldn't recommend it 150 meters to whatever then fits your business use case. And, and Bill, I'll, I'll add on to this because I think it's an important question as well. Uh, we got asked it earlier to end the day. How would you test geofence? These devs, they're going, they're implementing. How should they go about testing? Yeah, that's a great question, Tyler. Thank you for bringing that back up. Test geofence testing on devices is tough, and that uh, the ones the way that you saw actually in the demo that we used today was I downloaded a run from my, map my run. That's my normal route, and I turned that into a GPX file, and then I fed that GPX file into an emulator, and then what we have around it is known fences that we expect to have pop up on those known routes and we use the should show notification in our, our test suite that we have and it actually should then get all of the notifications. It should be able to tell if it was a, a fence entry, a fence exit and what the correct content for those uh, fences are. And the ways that we found that you can do it successfully are using GPX files and emulators or simulators. You can sneaker net it just by creating the fences that you need and grabbing your physical device and getting out on the road and you know beating your feet out there. And then if you have use cases that are around vehicles, you should test it at speed 
and and GPX files allow you to do that too. You can set how fast you're traveling and you can set paths that you want to go through and then you can validate that fences are there. But to me, there's really nothing that beats the actual on device uh, testing. So throw it, throw it in your pocket and go for a drive and make sure that you got all the fences that you expected to get. Awesome. I think this is a good stopping point. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Tyler, for your wisdom. And I appreciate it. And I'm sure our attendees appreciate it as well. Um, just to follow up to everyone, you will receive a email with the questions as well as the presentation. So keep a, keep an eye out for that. And with that, I think we're done. Have a wonderful night or morning and thank you for joining us. Have a good one. Thanks.